so I can call the meeting to order. Um, you see that uh, the focus of the meeting, we have, we have a budget update um, and some executive limitations reports. However, we're going to start the meeting, uh, even before we have a time for public comment, we're going to start the meeting with a presentation um, by our elementary principals um, as part of our ENDS monitoring work. So, Thank you welcome. Thanks. 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 Nice. So Elaine has had asked us to talk about um, making informed instructional decisions. So we have just a few slides to explain that process. So, so we used to, I guess, well, last year and before we've been invited to talk about like the literacy wall, and 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 we've over the years been really proud of the work that we've done with that on keeping track of our students and how the reading's progressing. But but it turns out there's so much more, and those are just little like two or three time a year snapshots. And so, so we've expanded that work a lot. Um, we, we recognize that if we looked at all of the Common Core standards, we'd be in school, well, in terms of some of your ages now, we'd just be, we'd be in school forever. And so there isn't time to do that. So we spent a lot of time over the last couple of years um, looking at the standards and picking out the essential standards. And uh, with the help of our literacy and math coaches, um, really putting them into the units of study. And now this year we're finally in the place where we're creating common formative assessments, and you'll see them up there, CFAs, um, listed that way. And, and we use those as a check-in, that okay, we've taught you this, but can you do it? And then it's kind of like, well, what do we do if they can't? And so, um, all those CFAs, as that we use with elementary students. Um, I know the names of them won't mean a whole lot to you, but just to let you know, Ponce's Middle, all kids are tested on that. Track My Progress is new this year. It can be done in literacy and math. It's on the computer, which is really interesting for first grade and up. Um, kids love to be on the computer, as you probably know, so they liked it from the start. It's really pretty quick, less than a half an hour. Uh, and the test does adjust a little bit for um, whether they're getting it wrong, 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 or right, and it will go a little bit higher or lower. Um, the DSA, which is a spelling test, the PNOA is a kindergarten through second grade math assessment. It's um, a little labor intensive, but every student does get that a couple times a year. Um, Mid-year, just the students who are remedial or below standard get it, but the, everybody else beginning and end. ESGI is more like um, kindergarten, first grade. It's letter ID, sounds. There's a little bit of math in there, too, that we can do. Um, there's the CFAs that we've already talked about. TS Gold is preschool. You may uh, or may not know that we have to do a, a fairly comprehensive preschool assessment beginning and end of the year. is twice a year. It's required for public preschools to do that. Um, if we printed that report out, it's probably about 30 pages each child. A lot of it is through observation, and so you, teachers set up that activity. You know, if they want to see fine motor, they purposely set out scissors or some kind of activity, and then they can assess. So it's not like they're sitting down testing the kids. It's mostly through observation um, that they do that. And adding um, Track My Progress this year, uh, we a little bit overwhelmed our teachers. We're like, really? Another test? <laughs> and and. And, but it was kind of on the promise that, with the goal that if this really works, it will actually replace. So it's like, a, it gives us the ability to screen and potentially not do the PNOA, which is really labor intensive. And it gives us the same information in a nice tidy package, then it'll save us a lot of testing time. Um, so ultimately they win this year. They're, they're working really hard. Um, I think the, one of the important things is that what they're doing this year, um, there, there are too many assessments at this point with adding them, but one of the nice things is they're comparing the results of all of them to make sure Track My Progress is where we think it is. And so that is one of the nice things of having several assessments is, all right, how do the kids do on the PNOA? How do they do on Track My Progress? What are their SBAC scores for third grade and up? And making sure that they're all pretty similar, and that way if we reduce those assessments, um, you know, it won't be wildly different. I just have a quick question. So the CFAs, are, are those something that the teachers themselves created or? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. 
They did. Um, we'll talk in a minute about where we are in that process, but they, after they identified the essential standards, so we started with CFAs last year and we're continuing them this year. Right. So we're a multi-tiered system to support school, So, which, which means basically we have a lot of different ways of meeting our kids' needs. And um, at any given time, in a school, you might see these things all going on, but like not all in the same classroom all at the same time. Um, um, Co-teaching is specifically um, a special educator working in a classroom. The teachers are working collaboratively. Uh, so with there are like six different models that they can use to meet, meet students' needs. Um, uh, traditional way is small group instruction. They can be done by our special educators or our interventionists, one-on-one -on -one support. Um, often sped, but sometimes with our interventionists when kids have intensive needs that we need to meet. Win blocks, uh, win stands for what I need. Um, the best example we have of that now is the third and fourth graders in Randolph uh, have set aside a block where all they do is deal with math and it's after looking at CFAs as they they reorganize the kids in small groups and say, this is what they need to do right now, this is what they need to work on. And so they deal with that, and then those groups aren't static at all. Just like, next time there's a CFA, what they need to work on, that's what they're doing. Um, and then, of course, we have our traditional um, um, students with, on their IEPs getting to that specialized instruction, some of which gets dealt with back in co-teaching, um, some of it in a separate place. And if we find something, you know, say we have a couple of kids on an IEP and a classroom that's co-taught with a special educator in there, if they're not making progress, we'll try one of the other approaches. Then we might do a pull-out model or a little extra or something if the co-teaching is not working. So that's constantly what they're looking at when they look at the data, is if they need to adjust which approach is being used. And what happens for the kids who are ahead? Um, similar, similar to that, actually the three or four teams is a good example in Randolph because um, they, when they do that wind block, in fact, last week, I think, Lane, when you were there, there was one teacher only had a, a few kids because um, whatever whatever it was on the CFA, there was only a few kids that missed that, and a couple other rooms had bigger groups, and there was one group doing enrichment. And so it actually enables us to challenge those kids that are ahead a little bit more um, because we're really giving that remedial instruction as part of that wind block. I know in Braintree, K through third grade, um, teachers are are teaching, we separate them out by grade for math, and then they're just keeping those math classes for that kind of that win block. We won't call it win, but it's you know it's extra time on learning um, and staying with their math teacher for that. Um, and we'll show you in a minute. Take the next slide. Oh, you're still in the so, Yes, so um, um, the student data that we've looked at has forced us to change our programs a little bit. Um, we started this last year we used to have literacy blocks that were 75 to 90 minutes guaranteed and this last year um, we did the same with math and um, and, and some teachers were like well no it can't be done but it turns out it can and and those turning into a challenge with there are only so many hours in the day but they're getting we had the about literacy 60 and the minutes last year when we talked to teachers right. there it was roughly 45 to 60 in some cases mm -hmm. for math and that wasn't long enough right. um, so teachers came up with a plan right. to change it um, even to groups who don't have a win block, we're, they're reteaching the essential standards to reach mastery. They're really, and they're doing that within the classroom. They're, they're making sure that the kids are doing the best that they can on the standards before moving on. And we've got all highly qualified teachers, of course, to do the best first instruction and that remediation within the regular math and literacy blocks. So the data review is done at several different times. Um, one of the times is doing is the half days that the board approved last year for us to do. That's really crucial. Another one, uh, there's a half day tomorrow. Teachers are working in both lat literacy and math groups to look at data tomorrow. Um, so we do that on the half days. We also do that, we, we call them PLCs, professional learning communities, on Tuesdays for elementary school after school. Um, three out of the four Tuesdays are those PLC meetings, and that's where we also look at the data. Sometimes um, teams do it together. You know, in Braintree, it might just be Betsy and Janie out there doing it. Um, in Randolph, they have great teams and a release meeting during the school day for teachers to look at some of that data. And then the MTSS leadership team, we meet this Thursday. We meet um, about once a month, and we'll look at data. We've looked at literacy and math data. This week, it's our time to look at behavior data. And so we'll be looking at all that from all three schools, and we combine that to look at that and to look for patterns and see what's going on in the school and what do, do we need to adjust anything. Um, so there's a lot of opportunities to look at that, and teachers are really um, 
I sat in on a, on a discussion a couple of weeks ago for a group of teachers, and it was amazing in one year, I felt like there had been such learning for teachers for analyzing the data and what they were gonna do with their instruction um, as a result of that data. So, and like with everything else, um, you're never really finished. Um, we want to be able to do the same work that we're, we've done now with math and literacy. We want to be able to expand that work into science and social studies. Um, we want to be able to take the work, the curriculum stuff in math and literacy, and um, put some model lessons in place for teachers because, because while the curriculum's in place, uh, teachers have some ability to be flexible on exactly how they share that with children. So we, children that we want to be able to um, kind of put something uniform in there. It's like someone comes in fresh, this is what you can do. You could modify it later if you need to. Um, you know, we still struggle a lot with students um, who've had trauma in their lives and we're spending, starting to spend about a fair amount of time um, learning how to be trauma-informed um, adults and, and a school. And um, we want to expand preschool as an early intervention. So th these, are, these are our goals. And some of them are already started, some of them are in the works, but we can't say, yep, they're all finished. There's always more to do. There's always more. <laughs> Any questions? I, I think um, it's very commendable. Um, because what you're seeing is they've hit all three tiers um, of what leads to effective instruction. They've got the structure in place, um, you know, ensuring the time on learning is where it should be. Um, they've got an aligned curriculum that they've worked on over the course of a number of years, and now they're doing the, the pivotal piece, which is um, being informed about the delivery of instruction, taking a look at how effective it is uh, with the students and, and kind of adjusting things to match when needed. So. They've done a, it's an exceptional job. And once children don't meet that, you know, during the CFAs, then it's retaught, and then there's another, you know, CFA again to test it again. So um, teachers have, they have that down now, and they're doing it consistently. Are there any comments or questions? Thanks very much. Thank you for having us. Does any Either of the public have any comment or question um, that you <coughs> want to ask, please, principals? Thank you. Um, I was curious about the budget update. I know it hasn't, it's not a topic yet in the meeting, but I think there's one public comment section. So I really like some of the material that I read from Lane uh, in this meeting's materials about the potential impact where it seems like there's some wiggle room between our average pupil spending now compared to the state average. So one question is, um, how that's going to be communicated to taxpayers to make sure they understand the lack of impact it might have. Um, and the second question is, if this budget does pass, how much room would there be for the next year? I'm not sure how the formula works. Is there like, is it based on percentage increase from the previous year? So there'd be room if needed in the, in the next year, or would it just be um, more based on an average per pupil? Yeah, so we're going to, I'm going to do actually a PowerPoint um, that'll actually touch on all those pieces. And, and like you were talking about, um, the whittling down that we did from the last uh, budget session that these guys worked on um, over the course of the last month or so. They don't know this yet, but what you whittled it down to gets us under the threshold and preserves a buffer. And so that's a little bit of what we'll talk about tonight um, when we get to that point. So good stuff. So you can let, let Erica know. I know she'll be happy. I will. Yeah. <laughs> we're waiting to hear that. <laughs> now we just figured it out today because we're still waiting for some of the state data to come in to you know for how the formulas are calculated the last of it will be in on December 15th or at least it's supposed to be but it looks good right now Hasn't had an interventionist for example, so remedial 
Did you have any other comment or question? Okay. All right. Thank um, you very much. Thanks, yeah, thank you very much. Um, we do need to assign an evaluator for this meeting. Do I have someone who would be um, willing to volunteer? Thank you. Okay. Um, I guess next on our agenda is to discuss the potential solar project at Braintree School. Yep. So we actually give um, Adam Wiggett a lot of credit. Had um, done some kind of the background research for us in terms of the school and what potentially, you know, might be possible uh, in terms of bringing, you know, the solar panels in. Um, on Braintree School. Um, obviously it would have to go out to bid um, at that time, but at least he's given us some kind of ground groundwork information to work with. Right now the building in Braintree um, spends about $1,700 a month on electricity. Um, the solar project uh, is projected to cost on the low end of 200000 So um, he, pr he predicted about one ninety four. dollars um, If we add some of the other changes that are going to need to go along with it and some of the other survey work, it's probably 2 10 ish um, give or take. Um, the solar project, as it's kind of envisioned, it would supply all the electrical needs of the building for the next 20 years. Um, and over the course of time, the solar panels do degrade. Um, they have pretty much a 20-year lifespan. After that, they're still going to be producing electricity, just, just not at 100%. Um, and so, you know, they're probably good for a good 30 to 40 years, but it may not be covering the full, um, full cost of uh, the electricity that the building needs. Um, full payback uh, for this would be in the 10 to 11-year range. Um, but the nice part is, is if it's paid up front, you know, that's a reduction of, of 20000 or so from the, the budget uh, that we don't have to worry about in terms of electrical costs. Um, and taking a look at the building, it does have a metal roof, which is great because they last a long time. Um, so there wouldn't be any damage done to it. It's actually a clip system that they use on the seams um, to connect the, the solar panels to. Um, there would be a few holes that are drilled through for wiring, but other than that, um, everything should remain as it is. Um, typically, the metal roofs are good for anywhere from 50 to 100 years. Um, so it should outlast and outlive you know, the, uh, the solar panels that are up there. Um, and how old is that roof now? I think 10, probably, 10? yeah. I was going to say about about 10 to no, 15. No, it's more like 13, I think. Okay. Yeah. Because it was put on the year before I came on the board, and I've been on the board 12 years. So. Yeah. And so if uh, if folks decided to move forward with this, and the reason to be talking with the board about it under policy governance is because, you know, it would be taking a look at pulling the money from facilities, mm -hmm. um, the facility surplus line. Um, next step would be to uh, work with Bob and Wes to connect with Green Mountain Power to have them do a survey. Um, just to see if the grid out there can handle the generation of the electricity. Um, I think as Adam said, that survey would be about $1,000 to get done. They said sometimes, he said sometimes Green Mountain Power will do it for free if they've done other surveys in the area. Like if they've already, already done one, they have an idea of, of whether or not their infrastructure can support the, the additional electricity that's generated um, just to let us know if it's possible. Right? Their, their infrastructure may not support it. Um, that would be the first step. The step after that, if that came through, um, would be to get a structural engineer out there just to take a look, um, make sure that the roof can support the weight, um, and make sure that uh, you know the, the, the roof is in, in good enough shape to last the amount of time that, that we need it to, which I'm sure it is. So. so, do people feel like we're ready? Do we have enough information to proceed? No. I, would, I mean, you're going to do that that research, and then you're going to present it to us, yeah. and then we get to make a decision. Well, do, do we have to vote on the $1,000 for no, the that, survey? No, that, that I've got. Okay. Um, but if there was no interest, I wouldn't want to spend the, okay. the $1,000 as well. Well, so do we have not I mean, That's what I'm asking, really, is that do we want to move forward on, on, you know, seeing whether this is even a possibility? So do we want to allocate the $1,000 and then perhaps the 10000 did you say, for the surveyor? Uh, probably in that, that yeah. range. Um, and to do the planning, they would have to pull together uh, 
a set of plans, blueprints on what it would look like so that when it goes out to bid, people know what they're bidding right. on. So where would that, and that money, would you pull it out of surplus or? Yes. Yeah. So, so there's. You would need to approve you pulling that money out. At, at some 000, point in time. The 11000 Or, or uh, do you have the 11000 That so one much? may, I think we can probably cover. Yeah. The, the reason I'm saying that is because we've got um, the structural engineers taking a look at the Raven building. Um, it's not going to cost too much to, to send them over for a day. Mm -hmm. um, so. you, and of course you're investigating grants and things like that? Yeah. Okay. Because yeah. it would be great to get some, some of the costs back out. Yeah, it's funny. There's, a, uh, there's still a big tax break for private folks. Um, mm -hmm. Right. Um, significantly, it's like 30 30 percent. Um, you mm -hmm. get to save on your taxes uh, relative to the cost which you put in. But since we don't pay taxes, right. I got to figure out how that plays into the whole scenario. Yep. So, so do we need a motion to uh, I think authorize just, you to proceed, or I think just general, if you know, thumbs up, thumbs down, um, so I can get a, a, a read of the board. If it looks like the majority is at least interested in the investigation, then I'll, I'll definitely, you know, spend the money to move forward. Like I said, I've got the money um, okay. to be able to do it. So is everyone on board with moving it forward? Yeah. Okay. okay. So I'll, I'll check, see how, how quick we can turn around um, the Green Mountain Power uh, survey, um, and then, then get back to you as soon as we know. Okay. Sounds good. Okay. The next is the annual report to voters. I guess that's my report. Um, so I, this is um, this is what is going on to the website um, under our OSSD um, pull down, um, and then it will also be published in the um, t annual town report, which goes out in the Herald and what have you. Um, so if there's any inputs, um, I've I, I wrote it. I uh, ran it by Ben Merrill, who was the editor. Um, he, w he was putting it in on the, it's the very first page oh, after the, um, you're welcome um, to send me edits or comments or suggestions if you want something added or changed. When I was reading through it, I found a little typo. Yeah, the enrollment one. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I will bring that to his attention. I was surprised it wasn't underlined. Like, I think I did it correctly and he didn't, but who knows? Because <laughs> <laughs> I went through, but who knows? Yes, I don't know. Um, so, but if there's anything really substantive, like feel free to right. let me know. I don't think we have to vote to approve that. I think that's. Um, no. no, but I'll I need a final would, version. Yeah. For Right. January. I think we I'll send it next January. week or okay. this week. Um, one thing I did want to wonder if you might want to put the student, the actual student numbers in. The that's what the principals do. Okay. I just was like thinking, you know, that's something that people are actually very interested right. in. Right. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it's it's a challenge, you know, because Lane will have a report right. and the no, and no, the no. principals will all have reports and so we really need to, I need to fill our niche right. um, and of not course. step on anyone of else's sort of. I'm just like reading through my jurors. So in what way? In what way? <laughs> yeah. I you know, you know what I mean. Right. I, 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 can, I could see whether I could, should add just, you know, sort of know, general numbers. Most of the town reports have an, an enrollment chart yeah. they put in. They do. Not um, everyone. But I've always poured over that. Okay. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why. I actually have the enrollment numbers too. If he needs them, I, I shipped a lot of that information over to him uh, right. based on he's working, helping me out with mine as well. Um, so he should have it. Yeah, well, it's, it's nice. It's, it's always a good thing to report. People yeah. will like to see that. We're at 50 kids. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, next is the budget update. And there's both a report in our agenda and then an updated report which Lane has provided here yep. um, with some new information. So if you want the updated version. And if there's a couple extra copies of these folks want. Because what I'm going to do is a, a PowerPoint, um, just as kind of an, of an overview summary, and then kind of get into the, the big picture of, of, you know, what the final costs and things are. But this kind of breaks it down in a little bit more detail.
Uh, one of the reasons that you know you kind of got a tentative one and then, then we updated it was because uh, we were waiting on some state figures to come in so that we could do the calculations um, and make sure we knew where we were at relative to the student spending threshold. Yeah. 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 I may sit because I see the read here with my bad eyes. All right, a couple things to, to recognize. Um, you do have three separate budgets that are there. Uh, reason being is because the, uh, the district budget, uh, which encompasses the high school and the elementaries, um, is separate from the technical center budget, which is separate from the Raven budget. Right? They all have different kind of funding sources where the money comes in from, so, so we keep them separate in the reporting. And so I'll show you some information on, on each of those as, as we go through. Um, overall strategy that we're looking at in, in creating this budget, because it's one of the tools that we use to kind of address um, meeting the ends and, and, and achieving what it is that the organization has set forth as important, um, kind of falls into this idea of building structures that are going to help us save costs down the line. And we talked a little bit about that with the trauma-based um, behaviors that we're seeing. Um, but two pieces here. We've got the academic. Um, a lot of the effort is being spent right now to support the students that are in the pipeline until the curriculum changes that we're working on um, go fully into effect. So we've got a lot of interventionists. Um, there's some paras there that are working with, with students and what they are doing is they're filling in the gaps of knowledge um, that they've got because the curriculum wasn't up to speed. Right? As we get the curriculum up to speed, uh, we get the delivery up to where it should be, um, eventually this need for those additional supports will go away. Won't be completely eliminated, um, but should be much re reduced over, over what it is now. Um, the other piece is uh, the idea of um, the behavioral component. Um, trying to get this wave of students um, that we've got that's growing every year uh, that are exhibiting trauma-based behaviors that are, is really negatively impacting um, the schools in terms of teaching and learning. Um, trying to find ways to work with them so that they learn how to self-regulate themselves. Um, and that was some of the discussion that we had a little earlier with uh, the preschool program and the therapeutic program, which we'll touch on uh, again um, today. But those students can end up being very expensive down the line. Um, a lot of them will make it through the elementary school, um, and then when they get to the high school, they end up actually being sent out for services. Um, because by that time, the behaviors have gotten so bad that we just can't accommodate them um, within the, the regular school setting. Um, if we can remediate them here, right, the cost is nothing in the end. Um, if we have to send them out, the cost is anywhere from 60 um, to, in one case, we have a student that's 279000 60000 to 279000 So every one of these that we can address has a significant impact down the road um, in terms of future costs. All right. In general, again, you guys have the, the specifics there, so I'm not going to try to beat this up too much, but if you have specific questions along the way, uh, make sure that you ask. In terms of looking at Braintree Elementary, uh, the additions that we're looking at is 1.35 teacher. For those of you in the audience, if you're seeing FTE, that means full-time equivalent. So a 1.0 is, is, is one teacher, one full-time teacher. So we're looking for 1.35 um, of a teacher. Um, those supports are going to go into uh, the preschool program and then math and behavior intervention. So we have some interventionists that come in and work um, in small groups and one-on-one -on -one with kids and to help give them the skills that they need. In terms of Brookfield, we're looking at 2.6 teachers um, and a, a half-time para. Uh, a lot of this is to support the creation of the preschool at Brookfield next year. Um, it's to provide behavioral support. One of the things that we talked about um, was the need to try to get a full-time administrator up at Brookfield. Population's growing. Uh, the administrator there, um, because of the co-principal model that we've got, spends a lot of time out of the building um, assisting down here at Randolph Elementary. Um, we had originally been talking about, okay, what we'll do is we'll get a, an assistant principal for Randolph Elementary. That will allow David to spend you know, all his time up at Brookfield. Um, in further discussions, which were, were very good, what they decided on was, hey, what we really need and why you know, David is needed there is, is for behavioral support. 
Um, what happens if there's not an administrator there is if one of our trauma-based students blows up in the classroom, and I mean they can blow up, um, because the kid cannot be removed from the, the, the classroom to be kind of calmed down, uh, be co-regulated with, um, what ends up happening, all learning stops in the classroom. And it may take a significant amount of time to get things back to normal. Um, if we have a, a behavioral uh, person who's up there, what they can do is they can remove um, the student from the classroom, co-regulate with them, and they are specifically trained to start teaching those, those self-regulatory skills to the students. Um, and so this person will, will provide that support when David is not there. Um, so that's the idea kind of as it, as it sits right now. Um, and we also need a full-time teacher. One of those 2.6s is, is a full-time teacher to support the increased enrollment that's going on in the field. Um, that's going to continue to increase next year if all the, the numbers uh, look the way that they do. In terms of Randolph Elementary, in terms of ads, uh, we're looking at two teachers. Um, one of them uh, is going to be supporting uh, the therapeutic program. Um, we'll talk a little bit, bit more about that when we get to the special education increases uh, because some of those teachers fall under the special education department. Um, but a, a teacher that's in there in that therapeutic program that is specifically designed um, to work with students that have these trauma-based behaviors and, and, and start to teach them how to self-regulate. Somebody who can spend time with them, uh, make sure they're keeping up on their academics, while also teaching them how to kind of bring it down and learn the skills uh, to do that for themselves. And also for mathematics intervention. Um, the numbers are actually going up um, in terms of the elementary schools uh, for ELA. So there's been some good news on that front with the work that they've done. Um, the mathematic works has lagged, work has lagged a little bit behind the, the English language arts work. Um, they're about a year or so behind. Um, so they're still going to need the, the interventionists for a while to fill in those gaps in learning while these curricular changes that they, they just talked about a little while ago um, are taking their full effect. If we hire all these new people that you hope we will eventually not necessarily need, mm -hmm. how does that work as far as the teacher's contract and stuff goes, right? We're obligated to keep people, you know, without, you know, unless there's cause. If there, well, if there's a budgetary, you can riff them for budgetary purposes. We won't need to. Um, and one of the reasons is we, we've got enough staff at this point in time, and we're kind of right-sized, um, that we should be able to do it through attrition. So in other words, what you do is um, as the need for a program declines, or the need for an interventionist or the paras declines, um, there's a lot of turnover every year. Um, so what you do is you just don't hire back when they go. Um, attrition is usually a, a pretty good way of doing it. Um, we'll talk a little bit when we, when we talk about the spending threshold, you know, times that the budgetary piece might come into play. And you would, you would feel comfortable plugging these people into a regular gen ed job rather yep. than a um, support per, or, you know, well, um, uh, behavioral support sort of position. Part of, part of that discussion um, is that you need a highly trained person um, to be able to come in and, and, and to work with these students if we're talking on the therapeutic side. Um, on the academic side, you want a highly trained person to be working with them in that content area as they fill in those learning gaps. And that was um, one of the models that the state was very concerned about a few years ago, and they're still putting pressure on folks, is this idea that we're trying to move away from paras, um, the paras are great people, but they can't really remediate. Um, you know, they keep things kind of going from day to day, which is a great, and they do a wonderful job. But they're, at the end of the day, they're not really adding a lot of value um, to the needs that the students have. And so it's this idea of trying to transition from the paras onto to licensed professionals. So, yeah, it's a good question. Um, go back. Randolph Elementary, um, RUHS is actually looking for, for three teachers. Um, the first one is actually a position that they had, had a little while ago. And this is a, a Tier 2 coordinator. Um, tier 2 is part of that multi-tiered intervention um, that they were speaking about, that Pat and David were speaking about a little while ago. Um, it's the next step up from classroom instruction. It's, it's an individual, um, talented individual, capable individual teacher who's working with small groups of students um, to help kind of fill in the gaps in knowledge that they have. Um, so the high school has this 
huge diversity of intervention programs for students to help them out at the Tier 2 and the Tier 1 level. Problem is, is there's nobody to kind of coordinate it all. Um, and typically what you do with these programs is the students should kind of move into one of these supports, get the support for the amount of time they need to get up to speed, and then they should be moved back out. Um, so there's some data analysis that goes along with this, which they would need a coordinator for. You know, what students should be going in and receiving services right now? Which students have gotten to the point where they no longer need it so that we can move them out and put other students in that, that may be struggling a little bit? And they've got, I think they, at last count when I was going through doing the observations, they got five different sets of programs um, for supports for students, um, which, which is actually pretty amazing. But they, they really feel this need to get somebody in there who can really focus directly on on this and coordinate the whole shebang for them. Um, they have a behavioral interventionist uh, now that will be moved out of title. Um, and again, and this is part of their work with trying to remediate uh, the students of trauma. Um, and also what they're looking to do is expand the world language program. Um, they had cut a teacher last year um, because they were thinking and kind of experimenting with switching over to a single language. Um, they've rethought that. Um, and they would like to bring uh, a teacher back, hopefully one that's dual certified, um, French and Spanish. Um, and with this additional teacher, it will also allow them to expand the foreign language offerings down to uh, the middle school. Right? Get some, some uh, exploratory work done now, down there with the middle school students to help get the students interested. The other thing that it will do is it will allow them to accept um, RTCC students over who need the world languages um, to be able to meet their graduation requirements at their home school. I mean, usually what happens is that the RTC students uh, will pay, you know, a tuition um, for those courses. So there is a need for that that we can't quite meet right now. Um, special education, um, these guys actually are supporting in the other schools. I've just kind of separated them out from the other schools so that, uh, you know, they're falling under the, the, the category that they're in. And the other reason that I've separated them out is at least for another year, special education teachers, uh, about half of their salary, a little bit more, it fluctuates between 50 and 55%. Um, we get reimbursed from the state for that. So they are not as expensive as bringing in a regular education teacher um, currently. Um, so we've got a special education teacher that's going to support the therapeutic program for the elementary schools. Um, we have, and we discussed this at, at a meeting when we looked at, at enrollments, uh, a school board meeting or so back, um, a significant increase in the enroll enrollment um, of students with disabilities. Um, so the, the caseloads have gone up on the, the current special education teachers, so we need a few more to do with that enrollment. Um, and caseload-wise, um, right, as the enrollment goes up, we need more special education teachers. But special education teachers aren't just working with the students in the classroom. They're also managing things behind the scenes with all the paperwork and the IEP meetings and everything else that goes along. And we've got some pretty heavy hitters in terms of students, um, students that need some pretty intensive work. And so we want to be very sure that we're not overloading uh, these teachers in terms of their caseloads, what they can manage effectively. Questions on special education? I'm just wondering if those numbers were included in the schools, or is this additional 3.5? So everything in this presentation is additional. Um, so same thing with this report here. No, but I meant you say 3.5 special ed, but... Oh, no, this is, this is an addition to what was... To what was presented in yeah. the other... Okay. So the, these teachers are literally going into the schools, but I kept them on a separate side because they fall into this category where okay. you've got that 50% savings. Um, so like one of them will be over in the... Um, in Randolph Elementary for the therapeutic program, um, and then there'll be a couple split up amongst the other schools to help out with the caseloads and the enrollments that have been going. So, bottom line, and it looks scary. Mm -hmm. And again, I always still adjust, but in terms of regular education teachers, we're looking at 8.95 FTEs across the district. Special education teachers, 3.5, and paraprofessionals, 1.0. And again, the idea is that the work that these individuals will be doing for the most part, hopefully uh, three years or so down the line, will have a significant impact and will be able to kind of pull back these additional supports. 
um, the culture, the climate, um, the work that's ongoing uh, will help kind of reduce the need for some of these folks, especially the paras that we've got right now. Right now we're, we have 26 paraprofessionals. I've worked in districts with 4,000 students. Um, probably the average for that is probably probably four to six. So it gives you an idea of the magnitude of the, the, the trauma-based behavior issues that we're dealing with. Um, but, you know, it's a, a significant um, chunk of those 26 uh, could eventually uh, go away. Lynn, can you just clarify the para? Say that again? <clears throat> so if I understand it correctly, um, it seems like what you've been sharing is sort of moving away from para, so I'm trying to understand where that para fits within the district. So the, the paraprofessional is uh, actually supporting the preschool program. Okay. So what they're trying to do, um, again, we've we got to be cost conscious, but we want the preschool program to go in. The Brookfield Preschool is going to be modeled on what happened at Braintree this year. So there's a public morning and afternoon, uh, middle of the day if folks want it, that would be a private cost. Um, what they will do is they will take the um, preschool teacher from Braintree, she'll spend half her time up at Brookfield, um, but we've got to replace that missing body because that is a full day um, program this, this coming year. Um, and the para is going to step in her place while she's up at. Yeah. And then half the time of that para will also be to support. So that's geared for the, the preschool program. Thank you for clarifying. Yeah. A lot of moving parts. All right. Talk on the threshold, and then we'll get over to the, the, the big details here. Um, right now, what we're spending, and everything is based on this, this threshold that we don't want to cross because mm -hmm. it'll uh, create an exorbitant increase in, in taxes locally. Um, the threshold that we don't want to cross uh, for next year is 18300 per student, and it's based on a per student count, right? It's expenditures per student. Where we are right now is 15600 which is $300 under the state average, and we've always been under the state average, so we've done our part. Uh, what we're looking for in terms of these increases would get us up to $17,600 per student. Okay? So we're still under that threshold, and we've got a pretty significant buffer, right? We're, we're pushing 900 kids, and we've got a $700 per student buffer um, that's built in if we hit this number. So we have space um, for the budget to grow if it needs to um, in future years. And one of the places that it has to grow is because of the step increases for the faculty. Right? Now, hope is, a couple of years down the road, some of the programs that we're putting into place is going to reduce the cost of, of remediating students um, that aren't getting the best education right now because the curriculum hasn't been up to speed and remediating the, the, the students that have the trauma-based behaviors. Um, that should bring costs down. The second piece uh, that's going on that's very helpful is we've got an increase in enrollment that's going on. People are more attracted to the school right now, um, which was also buoyed up by the fact that a lot of the high schools around us at the smaller districts have closed down. So we're up 50 students. Um, that 50 students translates a, a little over $300,000 in increased revenue that we didn't have before. So the hope is, is that we continue to get more students. And we should at least for another year. Right? You know, some of them have, have gone off to their, their first choices after the schools have closed down, and some of them are rethinking um, where they're at, and hopefully we're able to, to draw them in here. So uh, what we're looking at in terms of what's on the paper right now is increasing from our current 16.6 million to 17.4. Um, it would be a 12.8 percent increase. Keeps us below the spending threshold, gives us a buffer, um, and it gives you an idea of what the, the cost per student would be. Now, seems like a big increase, um, but remember, you guys have been fairly level funded for a decade. Um, and so part of the discussion that we had earlier was this idea that when you do that, you're losing ground. And eventually, you got to make it up. Um, had some of the programming gone into place, especially with these, these students of trauma, um, it might have mitigated some of that. Um, it might not have. Um, it's hard to tell. Um, but it's something that we, we really, really got to get a handle on because the, the special education budget, which relates to it, is growing by leaps and bounds at 15% per year. 
Questions on OSSD? I, I have a question. We're, we're, we're currently in contract negotiations, mm -hmm. as you're well aware. Um, if we were to give them what they've asked for... That, that alone would blow us over the threshold. We already did the numbers. Are we even close if we gave them what they asked for? Would we even be close to the 18? So again, this is all this is all all public, and we can we can talk about it too. Um, the the negotiation piece does not be, need to be an executive session. I checked because everybody's agreed to have it open. They're asking for an eight percent increase, um, which is huge. So if we gave them eight percent, where would it go? If we were at the 17.6, where would it go? So if we if if we took all this stuff to support programming and students and, and to make uh, life better for the teachers because this will help significantly in terms of what they experience every day, it would put us probably either somewhere between here and here, just that eight percent increase. And that's without, without the adding. program. Without the that's, that's without any plus. of this stuff. So from fifteen six, it would put us closer to nineteen with just a yeah. or whatever above eighteen three 18 with just that. Just for the yeah. Yeah. So it'd be, be right yeah, around that that line. Um, you know, the, and yeah. the big concern is you want that buffer because mm -hmm. uh, you don't know what, what changes. Um, you also have the other impact that, that, that's going to be coming down the line is what the state decides with the, the Teachers Association because they're going to a statewide um, agreement in terms of health insurance. Um, odds are it's not going to save us any money, um, but we're not going to lose any either uh, because it's probably going to come in when they get their negotiations done at what we're giving them right now. So for us, it's probably going to be no change, but nothing's guaranteed. If they go to 80-20, that's going to save us money. Uh, so theoretically, what could we afford to give them? Do you, do you know that? Have you so, made those numbers? So this budget right now um, builds in a 3% new money. So that's included so in that those numbers there. So is built in 3%. 3%, okay. 3% new money. Um, and, uh, and that would be including all these new... New teachers, everything. That's, that's everything. That's that also board. includes the eleven percent increase for the health insurance and everything else. I mean, this is the total, total shebang. Um, I'm just talking about what's new and different, mm -hmm. um, especially in terms of what's directly impacting teaching and learning in the schools. But all that other stuff is worked into here as well. Thank yeah. you. So it's a good, good question. My question is about. Um, we know that the funding formulas for special education is changing after this year, right? Um, so how is that going to affect a budget like this with so many special education kids and so many special education costs? We're going to uh, talk a little bit about that when we review the warrant. Um, you know, part of the pressure that I'm going to keep putting on is we do have surplus money at the end of m most years, right? We've got... Well, but, but that's not a long-term fix. I'm just wondering, how, you know, what, what is this funding... How is this going to affect us? You know, not, not the, say the we're going to dig into... how does this... Yeah, this, you know, so the what, what projected changes in... Yeah, so what happens in special education is over the course of the next three years, we move to a block grant system. So what that means is that um, at the beginning of the year, if the state has a formula, it will look at the number of students in your district, not the number of special education students, but the total number of enrolled students in your district will come up with a dollar amount, and that's what they're going to give you. So you have that lump sum, and that's got to carry you through... Um, the remainder of the year. The scary part is, you know, there are some reimbursements, there are some um, what we call circuit breakers. So in other words, if, if you get a student that moves into the district that's really, really high, um, they're going to come in and reimburse a little bit, not like they used to do. Um, so if we get a kid that moves in that costs us 200000 like we just had a week ago, we had, had another one, um, what do you do? You had a block sum of money up front and now all of a sudden you got this 200000 that that you're looking at. Or if you get two kids that move in that are in that ballpark like we had last year, now we're in a crisis um, because we may not have money in that block fund. And what do you do if you're a, a superintendent and that happens? You freeze the budget and you start cutting things that are, are not mandatory like athletics. Because that you can do on the fly. So one of the things that I, I've proposed before and I'm going to propose when we talk about the warrant is putting in a surplus line for special education, putting some money in there that's aside so that if in, the, in a special education line, so that if a couple of these students come in after we get the block grant and then it's blowing everything up, I can come to the board and say, hey, this is going to be the impact if you guys don't approve, approve this. 
um, this is something that you want to consider, and we have that money there to use if we need to. Um, I guess my question, you said that um, when you had 3.5 new special education um, teachers coming in, and you said they're 50 or 55 percent funded by the state. That goes away. Right. Yeah. So how is, I mean, that would seem to add quite a bit to next year's budget, um, or the, uh, you know, the, the year out. Potentially. The, yeah. Yeah. They, they haven't worked out the exact formula um, on terms of how that block grant is going to be determined. They have a general idea. But one of the things that they are saying is that the larger your special education budget is now, the more money you will get. And so part of that, that formula is um, as each year goes by, they look back at the spending of the previous year and they will kind of adjust it um, to match a little bit. So um, it's... It more or less adjusts to your population of students, Hopefully. taking into account that you may have some high needs yeah. but, kids. But, but kicking this off um, the way that, that we're doing with that additional 3.5, what that means is what we get in terms of the block grant when that year comes will be larger. The way that they're 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 planning. Unless they change. Things. Unless they change. Uh, but they, I think things are kind of pretty set. Um, you know, legislature know. can do whatever it wants when it does. <laughs> I mean, this whole to get on the the the, the philosophical piece of this, um, they did it backwards, and we've talked about this before. The way that they're going about changing special education and funding of it is actually really good if it's for academic problems. Mm -hmm. The problem is, is uh, the, the jumps in, in special education spending that we're seeing has nothing to do with academics. It has to do with the behavioral. Um, and this program will not support that because those kids are extremely expensive. And like you said, you get two or three that move into the district in the middle of the year after you've got your allotment and you put you in, in, in a tough bind. They should have fixed the system first and then adjusted the, the financing to match as opposed to using the financing to try to force changes. But this is what it is. So what we're looking at. Um, potentially um, is an 11 cent increase per hundred dollars of assessed home value um, if this goes through this is locally uh, we did the calculations and it's it's between 10 and, and 12 cents between the three towns wow. given that the average home value in Vermont is two hundred one thousand uh, dollars the average tax increase would be 222 which is eighteen dollars and fifty cents a month um, now, that $0.11 cents may be a little bit lower or higher, um, depending upon the common level of appraisal. So the state goes out and does this big averaging and, and to figure out you know, what houses should be appraised at. In some cases, the towns actually are charging a little bit more as they're generating their tax base. In some cases, they charge a little bit less. In towns that charge a little bit more, you guys are going to be paying less than the $0.11 cents because the state says you're already doing more than you should. If you're paying a little bit less, the state's going to charge you a little bit more than the 11 cents because it's saying you're not carrying your weight as much as you should. Um, traditionally, looking back, um, what I can see is that Brookfield is usually higher um, than that, that average. Um, Randolph is usually about even. Braintree is usually a little bit lower. So if you look at last year, Braintree got impacted a lot, and I think they've adjusted since then um, because they, their average assessment was below what the state said it should be assessed at. So while the other two towns were paying like a three or four per, four cent increase, they were paying close to ten. Um, so again, that 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 piece um, that piece matters. Okay. The other piece to take into account is that you know if you're hitting those income sensitivity thresholds, right? They do take care of people whose whose incomes are a little bit lower. Um, you know they're not going to be impacted as much by this change. Um, there are, are stop gaps that. The other thing just to be aware of um, is traditionally the, the monies that we receive in federal grants is not included in the town budget. Um, it's money that is, comes in and is spent for specific pur purposes like the title funding. Um, what they want is the rules have changed is they want us to report the, the federal dollars that come in as well. So even though the town, you know, we're looking at what, $17.4 uh, million? Um, it's probably going to look closer to 19 million because of the additional reporting of those those uh, those federal funds. The thing is, is the town is only responsible and the state is only responsible for the 17.4. The rest is just being reported so that there's transparency in terms of how much money is coming in from the feds and how much we're spending. 
questions on any? <clears throat> is there additional federal money coming in for the title positions then, or is it? Uh, the title funding is kind of like a block grant. It might go up a thousand or two, or down a thousand or two, but it's it's pretty stable. Um, it's sitting. I did the calculations the other day because we were talking about it at the strategic planning session. It sits around uh, five hundred and two thousand. So that money, you know, pretty much just rolls in. And then our job is, since it's a block grant, we go through this this uh, investment process. We do a lot of paperwork to justify to the department about what we're spending it on. Um, and if they're in agreement, then they let us spend it on that. So. But we're going to get rid of that title funding. Is that correct? No, the, that $502,000 uh, will come in, should come in, continue to come in every year. We might be able so to... So when you say you're going to move that teacher out of title funding... Yeah. That, You're that, not going to pay their salary through that money? It'll be in the regular budget. Um, and one of the reasons for doing that is as you go through, there's a couple of critical positions that we're not going to be able to function without. They were in title last year with all the changeover at the AOE and with the changeover in terms of uh, the paperwork that's required um, to get the investments approved. Um, things were delayed. We actually didn't get the money until about two or three weeks ago. So we spent almost a quarter of the year without being able to supply, su um, provide services to students um, because they didn't have their act together. So but we if we know that we're getting that money, why couldn't we just we can, you know, front the, the, you can't, the wages for the, that, that it's, person? Uh, it's one of the grant rules. Um, it's called supplanting if you do that. If we're able to front it, then they will come back and say, you can do this on, on your own. You don't need our grant money. Mm -hmm. um, so you got to be, be very careful with that. But, yeah, we wanted to, believe me. Um, what we're hoping, we put a lot back into, uh, into title that we were trying to take out. We kept out what was absolutely crucial. Um, what we're hoping is that as the, the state goes through the changes with the, the new secretary, um, who's trying to put in a lot of uh, efficiencies, is that next year we'll at least get the substantive approval, um, you know, in early September. What that means is you don't have your money yet, you're not officially approved, but you're going to be approved so you can start, you know, paying these folks. Um, and then, you know, you may have to make some wording changes or, or whatnot to your applications, but as long as you do that, then everything's assured. Um, so that's, that's the hope for next year. All right, so RTCC. Um, tuition, based upon what, what, what Jason's looking at, um, he's looking at adding uh, another half uh, a position to the math teacher. There's a half-time math teacher in there now. Um, wants to bring them in full-time because those are the skills that are, are, are weak for those students, and it's limiting um, their, their future prospects. Um, he also has a couple of folks uh, that are in the Perkins grant that never should have been in there, so he's slowly trying to pull them out. Um, and that's what the, the 0.25 paraprofessional is about. Um, he's got some increases in terms of transportation costs. Uh, there's a lot of students um, that are going off to, to national competitions and doing very well. Um, a lot of that has been paid out of pocket and donations up till now, so it's appropriate for us to su supply that transportation. And he's got some facilities needs. He's got his mechanical labs that are, are getting to the point where they, they need to start being refitted. Um, the biggest impact that RTCC has um, is that when the state, because the state pays for a lot of this, when the state determines how much it's going to give to the tech center, it takes a look at student enrollments, and it looks at student enrollments for the past six semesters or the past three years. The problem was, until this past year, the enrollment was low. The enrollment at the tech center for the last three or more years was down around 116 students. Right now, it's... <coughs> pushing 150, so it's gone up significantly. But the problem is, is we don't get the benefit of that increased enrollment until um, a little bit down the line. So that so increased enrollment is not going to yeah. impact us yeah. for a, another year or so. Um, so we gotta got to swing through um, a year or two, uh, and then our tuition will go back down. It's probably sitting around 17000 this current year. Um, so we're looking at it going up to, to about 18.2. Um, for the next fiscal year. Um, one of the things that Jason and I talked with him about this is going to need to do to sell, sell this a little bit is making sure that people understand that our tech center is much different than the other regional tech centers. 
ours is a full day program. The other tech centers that are averaging about 16, 17,000 a year are half day programs. We also allow the students to take math and social studies and health and PE and hopefully world language next year so that they can meet their graduation requirements um, from their sending schools. So there's a, a significant amount more uh, that we provide to the technical center students um, for that, that $1,500 or, or whatever it is that the others do not. Um, and so it's making sure that people are aware of that. Does this one have a per pupil cost like the other? You know, like you show this over there. Yeah, it's is a that over the per pupil. Nope. That so, so these students pay tuition to come here. So right. that's kind of the per pupil cost. Right. So they're paying. You know, when when a, a school sends them to us, they're paying eighteen thousand. They will be paying right. eighteen thousand two seventy three next year. So how does that recruit. impact their towns, though? They they end up paying a little bit more for the students to come. Um, the reality is, is who sends which town sends most students to the tech center. It's us. We recoup some of that because when the students take uh, the academic courses at the high school, um, the, the tech center actually pays the OSSD tuition for those students a little bit for those classes. So we do get to recoup a little bit of that. So what's the, what's the per pupil cost, state cost? Again, that red line that you didn't want to go over. There is a one. Yeah. Not, there is not, a one, not for tech. There is one not for tech. And it's actually, it's, um, it's against the regulations for sending districts to try to talk kids out of going to the tech. Okay. Right, so the kids want to go, they get to go. And again, this is a, this is a temporary. Um, it has to do with the low enrollments that are, that are going into the calculations. Um, we're up around 150. It looks like that's going to continue. Do we, know, do we know what has contributed to the increase in enrollment? Um, we had an increase across the board. You know, it wasn't just the tech center. I couldn't tell you other than the fact that we've got, got, a, got a very good program. Like I said, it offers a heckle of a lot more than the other regional um, tech centers do. Um, given that these students are all coming from the same, what used to be seven sending schools before the, the consolidation, um, a lot of them are just choosing the tech center over a more traditional education. I just have a clarifying question. So you were you mentioned that these students can use the high school for their math, English, but you're adding a math teacher to this. So what's the math? They they have enough students that need to take math that it's actually cheaper for them to have a, their own teacher at the tech center than to pay the tuition to send them to. So what level math are you going to be? That would be just a pretty basic math or? Uh, no, we've been talking on and off um, the goal, um, if and when we get there, um, and it's kind of the standard in the industry, as well as if the, if the students decide they want to go to college, the goal is to get them through the equivalent of Algebra two. That's kind of the gold standard across the country right now. A matter of fact, a lot of state colleges won't even consider you um, if you don't have Algebra two on your transcript. Um, but also in terms of the, the, the technical trades, there's a significant um, mathematical component uh, to what they right. do, so they need mm -hmm. the skills. And one of the things that's been limiting um, our ability to get them into in internships at like GW Plastics um, and to get them jobs is because they need the Algebra two. And so the kids will hear what that requirement is, and because they don't have the math confidence, they just they, they, they pull back. Um, and so, you know, again, it's, it's, so, it's a... So is this more embedded math, or is it... Like a math class. Both. Both. Yeah, both. In one of your reports that you emailed us, you mentioned uh, RTCC, the carrying on of the deficit that we've had for the past. Yeah, three, that, that's when we get to the whatever. financials. Okay. We, we can talk about it now if yeah, you want. So is that going to be addressed in this or in executive our limitation? Current, in, in, so it's in our current Today. budget. Okay. Yeah. Uh, no. Um, in terms of addressing that. Yeah. That's we'll talk well about it. Is that it can't be addressed. Um, right. The, the issue... So you were talking in the email about... Uh, there is carryover money that the tech center has, kind of like the surplus mm -hmm. for OSSD. Um, if we want to get rid of the, the, but that deficit, the only way to do it is uh, to have the board approve to take the money from... And so that would be of current money, so that's not in this budget that you're nope. talking about. Okay. Nope. No, and it can't be because it technically it kind of is tuition money we're pulling it from if it's carryover. Uh, but technically, you can't pay for that adult ed from, from uh, tuition money for this because this is meant to serve the kids. Adult ed is for adults. Mm -hmm. So they try to keep them separate, which is what's causing the problem. Mm. 
questions on tech. Then the last of the, the separate budgets is the Raven program. Um, has been it's self sufficient. Um, tuition will be twenty two thousand three oh eight up from twenty one five eighty one. The cheapest of the folks that they compete with to serve these students is probably thirty seven thousand. Uh, most of these students would, would be in an outplacement of about 60000 not including transportation if they weren't at Raven. Um, so it's a very, very um, inexpensive program that has a much better track record than a lot of, of what's out there. Um, changes for them, um, they currently have a 1.5 teachers there and a paraprofessional. Um, again, we're getting to this making sure that we've got the most qualified um, staff working with the kids. Um, is increasing that to two teachers, um, an additional 0.5, and then eliminating the paraprofessionals. This will also, you know, if we get to the point where we've got a new building, allow us to grow the program a little bit, you know, take it from 14 students closer to 18, um, which would be good. So questions on Raven? Saves us uh, about a million dollars uh, just in tuitioning out about every seven years. And saves us about forty thousand in transportation costs every year. So it's uh, you know we don't have to pay the money, so it's kind of hidden, but it's a significant um, savings that it provides to the district overall. So budget. On here, you've got facilities, HVAC. Did I, did I miss that up there? Uh, I didn't put a lot in on the, the, the facilities piece, which is here. Yeah, there are, in terms of the facilities piece, and, and we can talk about that now when we get to the financials, um, they are doing some additions, um, and we kind of talked about that a little bit last time. They're looking at bringing on a full-time HVAC uh, heating and air conditioning person um, because there was a significant amount of maintenance that was not done over the last 10 years, and there's a significant amount of work that needs to be done. It's actually cheaper for us to bring in our own person than it is to keep paying um, these contracted fees out to folks to have them come in and do it. And because we're a district with a lot of buildings, um, it's just keep cheaper to keep them on staff. Um, if we can. So that one's kind of a cost neutral change. Um, there are increases in a couple of lines um, just to make sure that uh, we've got enough money to match what historically has been spent out of those lines. You know, one of them is like snow removal, right, getting that up to, to where it should be. Um, they've been having trouble getting and keeping a full custodial staff, um, just, just part of the nature um, of the work. Um, and so what they're looking to do is to contract out for the lawn mowing services because um, they haven't had enough folks to really cover the lawn mowing the way that they should. Um, it's cheaper to contract it out than it is to pay our own staff any way to do it. And that money that they're looking for, the 42000 I believe that it is, um, covers the mowing at all schools. It's not just, uh, not just Randolph. Um, so it's a, a pretty good deal, and that, those numbers, are f that forty-two thousand, is pretty accurate because they've already gone out to bid to get an idea of what it would be. Um, and then they've added, I think, about seventy thousand to the overall facilities budget um, because, again, there was a lot of work and maintenance that didn't get done um, that needs to be addressed. Some of these costs um, that they're they're adding in um, are limited. Right, we got to get the work done, and then we can pull back a little bit. Um, there's some major repairs, some replacements at this point in time that have to be done. And then once that happens, as long as they're maintaining the proper maintenance, it shouldn't be a problem anymore. So, good. Thank you. I good think catch. selling the budget is going to be mm -hmm. difficult. You know, a 11 cent um, increase is, is substantial. Yeah. And um, I think <clears throat> that's going to be a real challenge, yeah. you know. And what, one of the discussions, too, um, with the cabinet between now and when we come back in January is there are folks that, you know, more folks we can move back into the type um, and bring, bring things down a little bit. Um, I guess a lot of it, too, is uh, the, the forum um, that we've got to actually get set up for the next week or two um, is uh, to get a feel for the folks that come in and that are talking. Um, just to get kind of a litmus test, see what they're, th what they're thinking, if they, they think it's extreme or not, and we can adjust from there. Yeah, I think it's, it really behooves us, you, to advertise yep. well for that, just mm -hmm. so that we get a, yeah. a good turnout. Because, it, you know, if, you know, 
it's better to do much advanced preparation than to go down and be scrambling and, and having to redo things. So yep. I really think it behooves us to really be proactive. So a good, a good chunk of uh, what's happened in the couple of uh, forums I've had so far has been talking about this. The folks that are there seem supportive, um, and they're usually the ones that get the word out. Um, I have been sending out, um, i got to get another one out, I've been sending out the broadband emails under a new communication system that have been keeping people in the loop and kind of what we're looking at and focused on. Um, and then the work that Ben is doing in terms of our annual report really focuses on this. Making sure that, that, that people know um, that, yeah, it's a significant increase in the local budget, but it's spread out across the taxpayers because we're under the threshold, um, that we've been level funded for 10 years, and it, it, at some point in time when you do that, um, it's, it's great because it gets you through, um, but you got to pay the piper. Um, I don't, I don't need any convincing. Yeah. But, I like, I mean, I do happen to know that the last time you were holding a community forum. I had no idea, and I read the Herald. You know, yep. I was there for the principals forum, and I couldn't stay. But I had no idea you were huh. holding a forum that night. So, do you get the do you get the broadband emails? From I you? don't. No. Do not. I wonder if it's because I don't your board think any of us do. I, I and you, well, they are going a, out to parents. Yeah. Right. Oh, parents. And what you need to be aware of is the towns. Right. In, there are more than just parents, right, and right. parents and are going to be really excited about right. this. Parents are, are, but are, are, are probably already on board with you. Right. It's the right. non-parents that we're going to have to worry and about. And they're the owners of our district large. just as much. Right. Far, right. We have so we far, got some work to do. <laughs> <laughs> we have far more yes. non-parents no than we have parents, and so I really think this has to be a community-wide yeah. um, you know, way to publicize this information and to get out in front of it you know, even now, just to prepare people. So these are the problems, and this is the way we're proposing to, you know, to address them. And, and really just... And we'll muddle through if it, you know, and, and, and do a pretty good job if, if we can't. Uh, but I, I think, like I said, it's important. And I appreciate, appreciate the comments and the support. Um, it's important that the community understand those needs, so you're right. we got to get it out. Yeah. I have a question and a statement. Sure. Um, my first question is this other line item, the $30,000 to pay for a mentoring program. Can you tell me what that is? So, there was a lot of money um, that was being pulled out of title um, that never should have been. Um, that is one of them. And the reason that it never should have been coming from the title funds, the government, the federal uh, title funds, um, is because having a mentor program for teachers, so this is the, to mentor new teachers, okay, that's is a saying. mandate by the sure. state. And anything that's mandated, we have to provide. So how the heck they ever let us use title funding for this, I don't know. Okay. Um, that's a program, um, too, that is going to have to be examined a bit. Um, it's not in the contract anywhere how much folks are getting paid, but we're paying six times what the going rate is for this program. Um, and again, we've got some fabulous people, so I don't want to damage the morale there. Um, but it's, there's some significant costs associated with that. I mean, we have some local funds that we're covering part of it, um, and that was an additional 30000 um, to cover it, probably because it was such an expensive program. And feedback as we package the budget for votes of approval. Yep. Um, I actually didn't ever hear any discussion about a student that's on an academic fast track, um, students that are doing well. What are we doing to incentivize and to make sure that we're responsive to all the students yep. and not focusing um, all of the budget increases on those students who are struggling in the classroom? I think that the idea of wanting to attract more students to the school, I think we may lose ground on that if we can't prove that there is motivation for students to excel. Yeah. Yep. And I don't see any of that in the budget that's been presented, which is a little disappointing. Yeah. Well, and we can, I, it's, a, it's a very good point. Um, you know, to, to, a little bit off the cuff is, uh, you know, the personalized, personalized learning that is a part of Vermont. Um, so a lot of these students, we've got the, a, a pretty robust AP program here. Um, a lot of them, like my son, is, is taking a look at the VAST program, you know, taking an early year of college. Um, so there is quite a bit out there, so you're right, that needs to be, be put in. 
um, to make make sure that folks are aware of that that it, it is not just about the 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 high needs high needs folks. Do we do you have any questions or comments? It's something we're always working on. But well, does anyone else want to answer? Nancy? <laughs> I, so I did, I saw in the last meeting there, you know, there was mention again that there were people, board members here, there were things that were going on over the course of the last few years under the previous chair and the that they didn't know about. And so if you're not reaching out as individuals or perhaps as a board at large, you're not, you're not going to necessarily be informed. So how do you step out of your comfort zone and reach out across the aisle and connect with people that maybe you wouldn't ordinarily speak with? I think that's a huge, huge undertaking, a huge ask. It's going to be hard. 